I have a podcast, Words and Numbers. I come out every Wednesday. And I and my co-host, who's a political scientist, talk about things like this. They're half-hour podcasts, half-hour episodes. So check us out. We have a few minutes for questions. Hello, my name is Daniel Levy. I'm from Scottsdale, Arizona. And you mentioned uh, earlier stuff about voluntary exchange. So my question is, what about monopolies? Would you consider monopolies an example of involuntary um, profit? Um, depends on why the firm's a monopoly. There are two reasons why a firm might be a monopoly. One is that the usually the government has imposed some sort of restriction that prevents other firms from, from competing. That's a problem. There's another type of monopoly that's a monopoly because it provides such a good service at such low prices, nobody wants to shop anywhere else. That one's not a problem. And I tell you why. Because the reason it's a monopoly is because the consumers have, have blessed it and said, we like what you're doing, we're only going to buy from you. The instant that company stops providing what people want at prices they want, they're going to go away and it will cease to be a monopoly. The grant of monopoly status in that second scenario comes from the consumers, not from the government. And therefore, it's not a problem. So would that be th things like... Um Rockefeller and Carnegie, people like that who were doing the oil and iron back in the 1800s, and then maybe people are comparing what they would call robber barons back then to Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos today with their companies that basically have, I mean, Jeff Bezos has almost a monopoly on the internet purchasing services. Sure, and sure, he does. He has almost a monopoly, but again, he has that monopoly because we gave it to him. How do I know that? Because prior to him was Walmart. And people were concerned about Walmart being a monopoly. As soon as Amazon came along, we ditched Walmart, we went to Amazon. And people, when they were concerned about Walmart being a monopoly, prior to that it was Sears. Sears was a monopoly. Walmart came along, did better than Sears did, we ditched Sears and went to Walmart. Somebody's come, gonna come along in the next five to 10 years that we like better than Amazon, we're gonna ditch Amazon. And we'll no longer talk, be talking about Amazon being a monopoly, we'll be talking about the next guy being a monopoly. It's perfectly fine. It's what you see is a monopoly at a point in time, but over time, no monopoly. As the consumers decide, we don't want this, we want the next thing. Thank you very much. Um, hi, my name is Ellie. I'm from California. And my question is, how should we respond to ideas like those of Peter Singer when presented to, uh, with them in the classroom? How should we respond to what? Uh, ideas like those of like Peter Singer and such when presented with them in the classroom. What does Peter Singer tell me? Oh, um, he believes that he believes that we should um, give everything that isn't a necessity to other third world countries. Give so, everything that isn't a necessity to others. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, there's there's a couple of problems with that. The first is what's a necessity? What we call necessities in this country the rest of the world calls luxuries. In fact, what we call necessities in this country today, 50 years ago, we in this country today called them luxuries. So it's unclear what we mean by necessity. Second thing, if we take, just take these things and give it, presumably by force, the government's gonna come in, take things from us and give it to the others. You solve the problem of, if, if indeed you think outcome inequality is a problem, you've solved it, but you've only solved it once. What you also did was you took away any of our incentive to produce more, why? The government's just gonna take it away. You've also taken away the incentive for us to trade with that other country. Why should they bother trading with us? We're, they're just sit back and we'll give it to them for free. And so what happens is you've solved the problem in year one. In year two, you're still gonna have outcome equality, but it's gonna be because we're all drastically poor because nobody's producing anything anymore. Great, thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Fernando Perez. Um, I'm homeschooled. And so my question for you is, which global trend will shape the world economy in the next 10 years? Like, for example, cryptocurrency. Yeah, what global trend is going to... So I'm going to make you a prediction. My prediction is going to be wrong because all predictions like this are wrong. I think it's going to be cryptocurrency. And, and it's, going to all, it's going to create a, a massive change, not in the way that many people think. And that is the following. Our government has broken through several layers of, of limits that we put on it. The first layer was the voters, that we're supposed we just vote out people who want to expand the federal government. We didn't do that. We like politicians who expand the, voter, the federal government. So that first barrier gone. Second barrier was the Constitution. 
The Constitution says the federal government can only do things inside this box, and I don't care what your voters want. This is all you're allowed to do. Well, starting about the 1930s, we got rid of that. I mean, we still have a Constitution, but nobody pays attention to it anymore. Virtually 98% of what our federal government does today is not authorized in the Constitution. Yes, I understand the Supreme Court said it's okay, but they went through all kinds of backflips to do that. If you read the plain text of the Constitution, it's not allowed. This is Article 1, Section 8. You'll see a list of eight things, eight, that the federal government is allowed to do. That's it. So we've blown through that. This, the third boundary that would have contained the federal government is the gold standard. With a gold standard, you take out of the hands of government the ability to print its own money. It can only print as much money as it has gold. If you don't have the gold, you can't print the money. We went off the gold standard in the over a period of time, but fully went off it in the 1970s. From that time forward, the federal government could print as much money as it wanted. Now there's no constraints on it. And so we're looking at a $6 trillion, $7 trillion budget this year, of which the government can afford 50% of it. That comes from these three boundaries, these three barriers being knocked down. What does cryptocurrency do? Cryptocurrency, if we get to a point, and I think we will, that we start using it regularly in transactions, it takes out of the hands of government the ability to control the money supply because the government can't control the cryptocurrency, with one exception, and that is digital dollars. And you'll see the politicians talking about, we're going to have digital dollars. All that is is an electronic version of the U.S. dollar. That doesn't solve any of the problems I'm talking about. I'm talking about private cryptocurrency. It takes out of the hands of government the ability to control the money supply. That, in turn, will limit necessarily the federal government. Would you say it's similar to like the whole things with like with uh, credit cards and uh, the banks that are like with the government and putting like everybody else in debt and people saying that, oh, no, credit cards are good. No, credit cards are bad. No, everybody should be using debit. No, everybody should be using cash. Is that similar to that? Yeah, um, I think the difference is people are going to decide for themselves what they want to do. That's the beauty of a private cryptocurrency. If it works, people decide to use it. If it doesn't, they won't. And so some entrepreneur is going to come along, come up with a different one that does work. That, just, that hasn't happened yet. We've got some cool technology, but nobody has come up with a cryptocurrency for the masses yet. And how do I know this? I'm really computer savvy. And it took me three months to figure out how to deal with cryptocurrency. If it's that user hostile, it's not going to be widely adopted. Yeah. Eventually, it will become user friendly. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you for answering my question. Sure, thank you. Um, Hello, uh, my name is Nathan, and I'm from Tennessee, and I just have um, uh, one question, and that is, in this time where the American dollar is starting to lose its value, and it's stagflation and incredibly high spending um, bills uh, setting us into debt uh, in the long term, what major players, uh, if other countries will be major players kind of in, economically in the next 20 to 40 years. I've heard India, I've heard China, um, I've, I've even heard Canada. It, what, if you could name f four to five of the major economic players besides the United States that we can expect to see more from, which ones would those be? I think China is, um, would be top of my list, and here's why. You've probably heard that China's economy is now somewhat larger than the United States economy, and people point to that and say, oh my God. First off, I don't care that it's larger than the United States economy. You shouldn't care either. Because what people have in mind is the image of a race. And China's ahead of us. And, oh, my God, we've got to get, go faster. The, that's not the way the economy is. The economy is not a race. It's a rowboat. And both we and China are sitting in the rowboat. And China is now rowing faster. And that's great because I'm in the rowboat. And it makes me go faster. So that's perfectly fine. But although China's economy is larger than the U.S.'s, on a per capita basis, it's like one-tenth the size. So China is sitting on a tremendous stock of human capital. People who are intelligent, who can do really cool things. You've heard the thing, and it's true, that China has more honor students than we have students. It's simply because there are so many of them. Now, take that massive humanity and remove the constraints that, that are on them, both you know, political constraints and economic constraints, and, though, and that removal has been happening over time since about the 1980s. Remove those constraints and all of a sudden you've got an economic juggernaut and the entire planet is going to be the Chinese economy. And I think that's, that's great because they're in the rowboat, they've got huge muscles and they're 
pulling, and that's great for the rest of us. Mm -hmm. So that's why I'd say China. After that, I'd say India for, for much of the same reasons, although India, yeah, for much of the same reasons. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, my name is Eric. Um, I'm from Snohomish, Washington, and I my first question, or just my question, was that uh, how do you feel about people who are in the upper class, uh, basic and what's considered rich, telling uh, poor poor people that you know this is how you this is how you live, this is how you become me, you know, even though a lot of those same people have not all of them, but a lot of them have been brought up and been given that opportunity instead of poor people who have to work their way up for that. How do you feel about richer people telling poorer people how to live, basically? Yeah, well, I think there are two things here. One, I think it's perfectly fine if you want to tell you know, poor people, look, here's how I got rich and you can do it too. That's, that's fine. In some cases, um, it's completely ridiculous because you know, Bill Gates is born to an upper class family and he goes to parents pay for him to go to Harvard and all of that. So, you know, you can say, do what I did all you want. Ain't going to happen. Right. But there are other rich people who came up from nothing. And there, I think the advice is really good. Now, giving me advice on how to better my life is one thing. Giving me advice as to how I should live my life is an entirely different matter. So if you've got rich people saying to middle class people, look, you should, you know, stop doing what you're doing, do this other thing over here, or, you know, you're being, you're polluting the environment because of your car, get rid of it. Meanwhile, I'm flying in a jet back and forth, right? That's, that's a problem. That's hypocrisy, right? Yeah. All right. Thank you. Sure. Hi, my name is Daniel Marcinak. I'm from Herndon, Virginia. And um, I just had a question. Um, as more people are accruing wealth, you know, like more people are getting more money, getting richer, things tend to grow more expensive to, you know, because more people are having that money. So if people are earning the same low rates over like an extended period of time, how could they work more easily to adapt their income and spending to be more comfortable in that economic climate? Yeah, so here's an interesting thing. This is the story of wage stagnation, which you hear a lot. And you, know, you hear p prices are rising and people's, people are earning the same amount they had before. And the pictures I showed you fly in the face of that. Because, you know, the guy from 100 years ago, he was earning 20 cents an hour and he could afford, you know, various things. And today we're earning more. And despite the fact that prices are higher, you can afford more today than you could in the past. Next time your grandparents tell you about how great life was back when gas was 35 cents a gallon, remind them that at 35 cents a gallon, gas was more expensive then than it is today. As a fraction of our incomes, gas would, today would have to be above $5 a gallon to be as expensive to us as gas was to our grandparents in our grandparents' day. So that's one thing. Now, talk about the, the wage stagnation. The wage stagnation, and you can see numbers on this, and you'll see average wages, median wages over time, they're sitting here flat like this. That's correct. That's what they're doing. Except it's a misunderstanding of the data you're looking at. And I give you a, uh, an analogy. You're a senior in high school, and you look around at your high school and 25% of the students are freshmen, 25% are sophomores, 25% are juniors, 25% are seniors. And you go off and you get a job and you get married and you have kids and you come back for your 30th reunion and you look around at your high school and 25% of the students are freshmen and 25% are sophomores so 25% are juniors, 25% are seniors. And you say, what's wrong with this high school? Nobody ever graduates. And you can see the problem here. Yes. Consistently, 25% of the students are freshmen. That doesn't mean nobody graduates. People are moving up the line and graduating while other people are coming in. So too with wages. Our median wage in this country is horizontal. All that means is that the average is horizontal, but for every one of us, we go up over time. So if you look, I have pictures not here, but if you look at the pictures, if you track not the median wage, but grab a group of people and ask, What's your average wage today? What's your average wage next year? What's your average wage 10 years from now? You'll see it going up. Thank you. Hi, my name is Audrey Riesbeck. I go to Dayton Christian School in Ohio. Uh, my question is, do you think we are headed toward another Great Depression with our current spending rate? Ha <laughs> ha. 
Um, no, I don't think we're headed for a Great Depression. I think we're headed for significant upheaval. I don't think the up some of it's going to be economic. I think the majority of the upheaval is going to be political. And I don't mean like people rioting in the streets or anything like that. What I mean is the following. Our federal government has become too large. And, and I, this is not a political statement, it's a mathematical statement. You can look at the mathematics. It is impossible for our federal government to make good on the financial promises it has made. It is, as we speak right now, bankrupt. It's continuing because it hasn't become apparent to the general population that it's bankrupt. And so the government can continue charging. People are still loaning it money. But eventually, people are going to become aware that this is, this is the thing. And I think they'll become aware of it within the next 10 years, when Social Security is supposed to become insolvent. I think what you get at that point is a massive restructuring of the federal government. I think you reach a point, and I think 10 years might be early, maybe 10 to 20 years. We're going to reach a point where the federal government has no choice but because of the laws of mathematics and finance to say we can't continue doing the things we're doing and to devolve much of what it does to the states. So it's going to say something like, look, we can't continue Social Security. We can't continue Medicare. So Virginia, you come up with your own plan. California, you come up with your plan. New York, you come up with your plan. And those plans will apply to the people in the states. And the federal government will become much, much smaller. And interestingly, that puts us back where we started. The whole intent at the founding was that the federal government would handle just eight things. That's all. Basically, it was things to do with dealing with other countries. But everything that we think of the government today is like we think about minimum wage, we think about Medicare and Social Security, we think about health care and tuition. All of that was supposed to be handled at the state level. I think that's where we're headed. So do you believe that we're going to like restructure our constitution, like our entire way of government? I don't know. I don't know whether we're talking about a, a restructuring the Constitution. In fact, you don't need a restructuring of the Constitution. Just read the document that exists, <laughs> right? Um, I don't think it's that. I, I think it is a restructuring of what it is the federal government does. That's what I think. That's going to have economic ramifications, and it's going to be a little bit difficult for a while, like it was difficult in the age of COVID for a while, but we'll come through it. That's not, that's not my... That's not where I think the majority of the change occurs. I think the majority of the change occurs on the, on the political side, on the government side. Thank you. Sure. Hi, my name is Alexandra Wong. I'm from Harrison High School. Um, and my question to you is, what is the argument for the millionaires and billionaires who promote like the liberal argument of um, equal outcome? Uh, when they were able to succeed in a society where it was, wait, it, where it was equal opportunity in inequality of outcome. Yeah, it, yeah. Um, I don't know. Not being a millionaire, I have no idea. Right? I can hypothesize that that part of what's going on is a desire to do good. Right? I mean, some of the people are just like people everywhere. Some of them are bad people, but majority of people, generally speaking, human beings are decent people. And I would say that so too, majority of the rich people are decent people. Um, I think what's going on is not, is not an issue of, of malice or, or ill intent, but rather ignorance. That it's really easy as a thinking human being to look around and see there are poor people here, there's rich people here, and these people are so rich, they could do something to help these poor. And so let's, let's do something. Let's tax them and give the money over there. What's harder is to understand the implications of doing that and what that means for these people's incentive to work harder and these people's incentive to work harder. And, and to realize that later on, you end up in a very bad place. I'll tell you what it's exactly like. You don't know this, but you will know it. When you have kids and your kid comes to you saying, you know, they want something that you know the kid shouldn't have. And it breaks your heart to say no, right? Because it's a wonderful a little guy like this, a big eye, it's the whole thing. Please, can I have more chocolate? So whatever it is, right? It's so easy and it makes you feel so good to give them what they want. 
But not always, but often it's the wrong thing. And you know that, look, if I do this, it's not going to be good. My son, I'll give you an example. He was a senior in high school, and he ran up texting his girlfriend. This was back in the days when you had to pay for texts. $400 on the phone, right? Look, at the time, I could afford to cover the bill. I said, no, you got to go get, get a job, pay for this. So I mean, get a job. He had, to get the, he had to bring me cash and count out $400 to pay for that thing. And it broke my heart as a father to see the pain that he was going through. But I knew darn well that if I didn't do that, tomorrow it's not going to be $400 in Texas, it's going to be $4,000 on the credit card. And then it's going to be $40,000 on something else. It was necessary. The right thing to do was the hard thing to do. And I think that's the problem with the people who say, look, we should just you know, redistribute wealth. That's the easy thing to do. But it, long term, it's not, it doesn't solve the problem. It actually makes it worse. The right thing to do is hard. Thank you.